Lamentations discusses returns with another episode on the season finale of 24 Legacy, 11 p.m. to 12 p.m. Before I begin with any of that, I want to say uh, hello to everyone. Welcome back. I also wanted to say thank you to all of those who have subscribed to my channel. I have reached over a hundred subscribers. I'm now at a hundred and forty subscribers if I'm not mistaken according to YouTube's uh, uh, information. Uh, I don't make my videos to gain subscribers. Uh, I make my videos because I have things that I want to talk about and things that I want to say. They have chiefly to this point been about TV shows that I watch uh, the Walking Dead, uh, they've been about Star Trek, about Star Wars, uh, they have now of course been about 24 Legacy, about The Exorcist, but nonetheless I have gotten over a hundred subscribers now and I want to thank all of those who chose to subscribe to me for whatever reasons you do. I know that a lot of this was probably chiefly due to my Star Trek Axanar videos uh, which was about an another uh, issue uh, related to that uh, particular uh, franchise but nonetheless that's where I got probably got the bulk of my new subscribers for whatever reasons you have chosen to subscribe however my appreciations but I don't make videos to gain subscribers let's get into 24 Legacies season first season finale hours 11 p.m. to 12 p.m. now as always there will be spoilers in this analysis so if you for whatever reasons do not like being spoiled I invite you to uh, re-watch or watch the uh, season finale at your own leisure and then return if however you are an individual who could care less about spoilers then we proceed forward and you take your own risks let me see, I wanted to talk about, uh, this is not in uh, necessarily in the order that it appeared in the show, by the way. I don't necessarily go scene per scene, although I do try to go pretty much in sequence. I don't necessarily go scene per scene when I'm talking about these things. So I may skip around a bit. The first thing, however, that stood out to me, and I thought this was quite good actually, was the Eric Carter and Tony Almeida fight sequence. Now, as some of you may remember from the previous uh, episode, uh, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m., they left off with Tony and his team approaching the safe house where Eric was retrieving Asim Nasiri's daughter, Ara Nasiri. And, of course, just as Eric is about to take the girl out of the house and get her to safety, um, Tony's team rolls up and, of course, they surround the house and they prepare to, uh, to move on the house and take the girl and kill everybody else inside. And as we saw in one of the scenes of 10 p.m. to 11 p.m., Tony did in fact shoot in the head one of the people who was guarding the safe house. So his orders were to take the girl, kill everyone else, sanitize the scene effectively, and then leave with no traces. These were the orders that he was given by Director of National Intelligence, Donald Sims. As per the fight scene between Eric and Tony, I really thought that this was nicely done. Now, at first, I kind of thought, well, maybe Tony's going to get the drop on Eric somehow, but it didn't go that way. It did show me, however, Eric won, and it did show me, however, though, that, that Tony still got it, as it were, when it comes to, you know, being out in the field. Uh, he, uh, you know, despite perhaps being an older guy, he still has his, he still has good uh, moves on him. He still has a good understanding of sizing up his opponent. He still has a good understanding of sizing up the tactical situation that is before him and how to, you know, properly assess that situation and then use it to his advantage. We saw that when he used, uh, when he had some of his men try to surround the house. Uh, we saw that when he used the breaching explosive to blow a hole in the wall or one of his other men approached the, uh, approached the target from the other side of the house uh, and used that, all of these kinds of things as distractions. Uh, these were very good. It didn't stop Eric from uh, actually, you know, beating or besting uh, Tony. Uh, maybe that was because, you know, Tony is an older guy, but nonetheless, we still we saw very clearly that Tony still got it when it comes to his uh, to his field experience. And so it was very good. We also saw the flashbang that was used by Eric as a countermeasure uh, against Tony once he did, in fact, get inside the house to distract and disorient Tony. I thought that was an excellent tactic on, on Eric's part. 
And um, so overall, I found this to be a very good fight. I think it was a worthy fight from the standpoint of 24 Legacy and of the 24 Heritage that 24 Legacy has in fact uh, drawn upon. So now, the other thing that was interesting to me in, in, in this crop of scenes was the interchange between John Donovan and Donald Sims. One of the things we see with Donald Sims while John is guarding him, Senator John Donovan is guarding him, is that he says, uh, without the girl, that is Ara Asiri, Asim Asiri's daughter, without the girl, all you have, John, are scenarios on my computer and you can prove nothing about what is going on here. Now that was interesting to me because it shows, I think, that there are a lot of these so-called quote-unquote scenarios that are run by our military and uh, intelligence complex that many of them never come to fruition, but there are those which do, and many of them we will never know a thing about in the public eye. But at the same time, they are scenarios, and these scenarios can come into play into the real world and thereafter be used as um, methodologies to carry out certain covert, clandestine, or what in the, uh, the deep part of the intelligence world is called black operations or black ops. This was one of those black operations. Uh, that was cooked up on DNI Sims's computer and the scenario was on his computer that is the, the scenario to kidnap and then hold to, to, to hostage effectively uh, Ara Nasiri so that if they ever had to use her as leverage against her father they would have her in custody. Now this made me wonder though the whole interplay between John Donovan and Donald Sims in which he was basically telling um, telling John Donovan just like in the previous episode, look, I'm not the one that cooked this stuff up. Your 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 wonderful wife did. This was Rebecca Rebecca Ingram's uh, uh, imagination. This was her doing that cooked a lot of this stuff. This stuff up. I went along with it, of course, and I maybe I even helped her. But DNI Sims is basically telling John Donovan, look, your wife was the one who was the point woman on this stuff. She caused all of this stuff to be initiated. She cooked it up in her head and then she brought up the scenarios and then made those scenarios come to fruition. You need to really think about the kind of woman you're married to. And he also goes further to say, you think you're saving your wife, John, but what happens when all of this is over and all of this information comes out? She is going to be prosecuted like the war criminal she is, and you will really see what she's capable of when all of this stuff comes to light. You know, everything gets dug up from these pits of deception so that men and women can know them in our country. You're going to really see what Rebecca Ingram is about then. And I was really thinking about that because I thought that that was a very intriguing line uh, by Donald Sims. And it was a very intriguing uh, uh, revelation about Rebecca Ingram, something that unfortunately now we won't get to find anything out about, at least not from her direct testimony. So Donald Sims, Donald Sims talks about uh, the fact that uh, you know once all of this stuff is uncovered, Rebecca is going to be prosecuted maybe in The Hague, in the Netherlands perhaps, or in maybe in uh, some other, you know, wherever they choose to try her is what he said. Uh, I mean, and, and he's, he's right. Uh, you know, generally, people like this can be prosecuted in The Hague. Uh, they might be prosecuted under some United Nations War Crimes Tribunal statute. Um, they might be prosecuted by the ICC, the International Criminal Court. These are places where war criminals, tyrants, and genocide perpetrators all around bad people go to receive justice. But, to my knowledge, if I remember correctly, none of these courts has ever prosecuted an American any American, and certainly not anybody uh, who is high up in the government, like, um, for example, a senator, uh, a congressman, a judge, a president, vice president, anybody like that. As a matter of fact, I recall uh, several years ago reading about some international human rights advocates who wanted to have former United States President uh, George W. Bush and Vice President Richard Cheney, Dick Cheney, uh, prosecuted as war criminals for their uh, alleged roles in the Iraq war uh, and of course <laughs> that wasn't going to happen and it didn't happen so I've kind of the reason I bring all that up is to say I rather find it difficult to believe that even though Donald Sims made this uh, kind of capricious threat that Rebecca would be prosecuted perhaps in The Hague or somewhere else I actually found it rather uh, uh, an empty threat 
I really don't believe that they would remand Rebecca Ingram to The Hague or to the uh, International Criminal Court or any other United Nations uh, tribunal for, for trial. More than likely what would have happened is that Rebecca would have been tried right here inside the United States, inside our own courts of justice. And if it was deemed expedient for her to be uh, remanded to prison after that, then she would be, or if it was deemed more expedient for her to be given some other form of punishment that did not humiliate and embarrass the United States government and the United States people, then she would be quietly put aside and put out the pasture, uh, and all of this would probably have been buried. So I think Donald Sims' threat to John Donovan at that point was a little bit empty, if you know how the real world works to some degree, but it was very interesting uh, from a dramatic point of view. Okay, so the next thing here is Rebecca taking a bullet for Eric. This was a scene that was pretty much near the end of the story. After they have struck this deal with Asim Nasiri and he has gone ahead to save Rebecca's life by killing Ibrahim Ben Khalid's people and basically taking Ibrahim Ben Khalid himself hostage, Ibrahim Ben Khalid finds a gun on the ground somewhere and he manages to shoot and kill Asim Nasiri and very and and obviously from the stand, from the uh, from the standpoint of the story he manages to not just seriously but unfortunately critically wound Rebecca Ingram she uh, sees it coming she pushes Eric Carter out of the way and she takes a bullet for him uh, as the uh, magnanimous and dutiful heroine that she is and I gotta say, I like Rebecca Ingram. I was kind of sorry to see her uh, to see her go, uh, but you know, unfortunately, I guess they had to have somebody die. But anyway, I kind of found it though to be something of an easy out. It's an easy out for Rebecca because, as as we were talking about before with Donald Sims, if she had lived and if these things had in fact come out, Rebecca Ingram would have had to face the consequences of her actions as the former head of CTU when she uh, initiated all of this stuff and then uh, initiated uh, some of these uh, these things with other agencies inside the United States government. Again, we don't know how high or how far or how deep this goes. We know that Donald Sims was a part of it and he did, I guess, uh, I guess you could say insinuate that he and Rebecca may have acted alone. I'm not entirely sure I believe that. Um, or that it was much, much more compartmentalized in a way uh, than what we may have believed. In other words, it was not a big conspiracy. And if you understand how conspiracies work, especially government government ones, they really are compartmentalized, and not a lot of people do know about them. That's 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 the whole idea. It's a very tight knit circle of of people who really know what the whole story is. Most of the people only know parts of it. Uh, that's the compartmentalization part of it, and so. You, uh, you don't want a big circle of people because the more the circle expands, the more the circle grows, the more the information can be diffused, and that way the conspiracy, that the, more, the easier it is for the conspiracy to be exposed. So you definitely don't want uh, people to, a lot of people to know. You do, in fact, want a small, tight-knit circle of conspirators. But here is what I found so interesting about the fact that Rebecca takes this bullet for Eric Carter, Carter and then uh, later on he die, she dies as a result, is that again, it's an easy out for Rebecca. There's nothing left to explain, uh, at least not for, from her part anyway. There's nothing left to explain. She gets, she doesn't go before any uh, court of law and testify. She's not humiliated, at least not personally humiliated. Her name may be run, uh, run through the mud, but she's not alive to bear that disgrace. Uh, it's an easy out also in terms of her husband. Uh, she doesn't have to explain herself anymore to him. You know, she doesn't have to tell him anything more about the kind of person that she was. All he has now, basically, is these speculations, maybe anything else he can unco he can uncover in the interim uh, about her that he didn't know anything about, and you know, and then he'll just have to live with it from there, which which maybe he is prepared to do based upon you know what he says. But the other thing that that interests me about this. I'm wondering if Rebecca's death was also a kind of a baptism by fire for John Donovan. A baptism by fire, if you will, into the world of counterterrorism. When Rebecca dies later on in the hospital, uh, there's a scene that follows that at the very end of the story when they, when they push forward 12 hours later. I'm wondering if this was a baptism by fire for John Donovan in which he is now beginning to see that there is a deeper world 
uh, in government than he has been than he has uh, thought about before. You've probably heard the words deep state before or shadow government. Okay, these are both terms that are used to describe not just the world of covert operations and counterintelligence, but what some people would argue is the actual true controlling force of government inside the United States. That is a shadowy cabal of people who are made of money. They are elites uh, and they are the people who run and control the government, who tell your politicians, your judges, your police, people, etc., 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 like that, what to do. 24 has dabbled into this kind of idea of the deep state or the, consp or the shadow government before many times in his past. We've talked about some of these conspiracies before in and outside of the government and especially with those actors outside of the government who use their power and clout to control people inside the government. We've talked about the Cyprus audio recording conspirators. We've talked about the Syntox VX nerve gas conspirators. We've talked about the prion variant cabal conspirators before. All of these conspiracies in the, 20, the original 24 timeline were examples of highly powerful, rich industrial type men um, and their minions who used their power, who used their money to control politicians inside of the United States government and get them to do their bidding. Okay, on behalf of whatever agendas they had. So, uh, 24 Legacy is dabbling into, I believe anyway, is dabbling into the entire idea of the deep state and or the shadow government. Okay, so I'm wondering if Rebecca's death was a baptism by fire for John Donovan into this deep state world of counterterrorism and beyond. Now, when Rebecca dies, uh, this is something that's been done by 24 in the past, the original series. When Rebecca dies, uh, you see the silent clock countdown. Uh, for those of you who have never seen that before, that is basically 24's own version of being able to honor those fallen men and women who have given their lives in the service of their country uh, and who have served honorably uh, to the end of their natural lives. And so this is kind of 24's version, I guess you could say, this is be 24's version of the riderless horse or the missing man formation. Uh, both of these things are ways in which the real world honors fallen heroes uh, who have served their country. So we, uh, you know, we bid rest in peace to Rebecca Ingram as she passes on uh, out of this world uh, to her rest. Uh, Rebecca's death disheartens John. But at the same time, we see that an FBI agent comes into the building and he talks to John Donovan about the fact that DNI Donald Sims was found dead in his office earlier somewhere in, this, in the episode. And we see this look of kind of sustained surprise and shock on Senator Donovan's faith, and rightly so, because by the time John Donovan left Donald Sims back in his office, the man was still alive. Well, we know that uh, Donald Sims from a previous scene was, you know, contemplating uh, which way he was going to take, uh, go, go out to. He, you know, he's looking at pictures of his family, of his children, of his wife in, in, in the scene. And then he opens his, um, his drawer, his desk drawer, and pulls out his gun and, you know, is looking around. Well, we kind of all know what he's going to do. He takes the, uh, he takes the easy road out so that he doesn't have to bear any disgrace for himself, so he doesn't have to go to prison, so that his, so that his family does not have to bear any disgrace of seeing him go to trial, maybe be put on trial in the public eye, uh, but certainly be put on trial, period, and have to face all of that kind of disgrace. Maybe you know, he might, they might lose his pension benefits or other things of that nature. So in, instead of doing that, he just goes and, and, and shoots himself, and he ends it all uh, so that he doesn't have to answer any questions either. If you want to say it, he took the coward's way out, uh, and he escaped, effectively escaped justice in that stand, from that standpoint. But... When John Donovan finds out that DNI Sims is dead, I think that it galvanizes him to stay in the race at that point. You might ask why. Again, it goes back to what we were talking about before. John Donovan is looking out at the Capitol building and he has this look of confusion and disorientation on his face, wondering what in the heck is going on. First, my wife is dead. And there were things about her I didn't understand. And, and, and this Sims guy is telling me things that she was involved in that I knew nothing about. And now Sims is dead. And he was telling me about all these things that Rebecca was involved in. And that he, as a consequence, was involved in as well. 
I think that this is John Donovan's first revelation and realization that not everything is as it seems in the halls of government. And here we go again, back to what I was talking about before, the idea of the deep state and the shadow government. And I think that, that Senator Donovan from there chooses to remain in the race because he knows that he has a very strong chance of becoming president and what he is going to do after that point is to use the power of his presidency to see what he can uncover and perhaps even rout about this deep state. Now he's going to find that a lot harder than he may believe but that's what I think his intentions are and from this standpoint he does in some ways remind me of David Palmer who was a very upright and honorable individual. I really don't think that we've been given very much to tell us why we should really like John Donovan. I mean he's an alright guy and he started to stand up a little bit more uh, in uh, you know have a little bit better estimation in my eyes over the last few episodes but uh, from the beginning of this series we were not really given any reason why we should like or invest in John Donovan except that we were being shown a few uh, campaign rallies that he was at and we were being shown why his father says this country needs you and all that but we weren't being shown why he was such a charismatic individual did he author any legislation legislation in um, in the Senate that would make him a, a standout man did he give any kind of uh, great or, or uh, magnificent speeches uh, about policy about America's uh, foreign policy or America's place in the world that would make that would endear him to the American people that would make him to be a standout um, a standout legislator in the Senate we haven't seen any of these kinds of things that would tell us why John Donovan is such an, such an awesome guy and so this this is why um, you know I think most of us probably have not cared about John Donovan now let me let me talk about these convenient closures one of the convenient closures, as I remember, as I uh, uh, already stated, is Donald Sims killing himself, Rebecca Ingram dying from a, a, a gunshot wound, the convenient thread closures of Nassim, Asim Nasiri uh, being shot dead, uh, the convenient uh, uh, closure of him actually killing uh, Ibrahim Ben Khalid's people himself, so that they did not kill Rebecca. The convenient closure of Isaac Carter just being absent from CTU because he has to go home or go wherever he's going to go and think about his future, which closes off, at least for now, the issues between him and Eric and the issues between Isaac and Nicole that we were already dealing with for several episodes. So those are some convenient closures that the past, that that skip of the past 12 hours uh, gave us. However, what is still open is Henry Donovan's role in the conspiracy and uh, his still uh, on the run uh, brother-in-law Luis, who is still out there um, trying to escape justice after he, he helped uh, get the Ben Khalid terrorist cell inside the United States. One thing that struck me uh, that uh, that stood out to me when I was listening to this was that Henry Donovan said that you know the uh, the son should not have to pay for the sins of the father. But my response to that is, well. That's true, perhaps, but the sins of the father can, in fact, still be visited upon the son. And I say that for, for, for a few reasons. Henry Donovan has not paid for what he has done. He has not paid for his role in this conspiracy. And he said that whether he spends the rest of his life in prison or he pays for it some other way, he will pay for what he's done. I agree with that because I still think that this conspiracy is out there. I think it is bigger than Donald Sims and Henry Donovan and, and Luis. Okay, uh, I think that there there is more to this conspiracy that we have seen so far, and I think that this conspiracy is going to call in its chips on Henry Donovan, especially if his son gets elected to president. So, uh, it is possible that you know one of the easy ways for Henry Donovan to pay for this would be for him to be killed, and we pointed out Jonas Hodges as a as an example of that in the previous video where we talked about his role in the Prion variant conspiracy and how when he betrayed them, they murdered him. But it may not be that simple for Henry Donovan to quote unquote pay for his uh, sins, uh, the sins of the father and those sins not be visited upon the son. Because the conspiracy might decide just to call in those chips, not just on Henry, but upon uh, John as well. You see, if he becomes president especially, they might say, you know, look, we helped you get here. We helped your father help you get here. And because of that, you owe us. 
Now you're going to do what we, uh, what we want and what we ask, when we ask, without question. But we're going to expose your father's entire role in getting those terrorists inside this country and his role in helping them blow up the George Washington Bridge and kill a hundred or more people. Now, President Donovan, do you really want the public of the United States to find out that your father, your family, was involved in a conspiracy against this nation to commit violent acts of extremist terrorism? Now, I highly doubt that he would want that to happen. So that, that would be a very interesting angle to explore right there, where I still say that the sins of the father can be visited upon the son, regardless of how well Henry Donovan uh, covered his tracks. And of course, this will bring disgrace and shame and humiliation all upon John Donovan, and particularly as president, and will be, it will bring disgrace and humiliation to his family name as a result. So I'm not... You know, this is a thread that is still open, but I'm not sure that, uh, you know, Henry Donovan has thought the, the implications of being involved in a conspiracy this powerful. I'm not sure that he thought all of this through. He was just, you know, uh, going through this as an ambitious man who was ambitious for his son and wanted to see his son, quote unquote, do good. And here we are, you know, talking about that ends justifies the means argument. We're going to do good by doing great evil uh, in, in, the, in the interim. Well, it doesn't always work that well, especially when the facts and the truth come out. So the final thing here that I'm going to mention is the fact that Eric and Nicole choose to move forward together instead of apart. Nicole tells Eric that she will face whatever comes with him as he chooses to go further into the world of counterterrorism and become an actual formal and official agent of CTU. And this is interesting to me because it does, in fact, shut down the, uh, the Isaac and Nicole thread, at least for now, because Nicole has committed herself to stand by Eric no matter what. So we'll see what happens with that. So that's my analysis of the 24 Legacy uh, season finale, hours 11 p.m. through 12 p.m. Overall, I found this to be one of the better episodes of the season. I still think that because they skipped so much, they skipped so many threads, I still think that that is a weakness of this season finale. Uh, they wrapped up very conveniently a lot of these, uh, and very tidily a lot of these threads just by killing people off, which, you know, you know considering the constraints of the time frame, that is acceptable, but if you really think about that, that's probably, that would be considered lazy writing. If they had more time and they did something like that, that would be considered a very poor writing decision. That would be considered lazy writing. And I don't think they would get away with it if they had, you know, another five or six episodes that they could do. If you come back for another season, 24 Legacy, come back with 24 episodes. Do it right. The viewing audience deserves that. And you deserve the opportunity to earn the loyalty of people who watched the original series by showing them that you can inherit the legacy as you say, of the original 24 and inherit it correctly. Not just by name, but by um, inheriting it through action, through deeds. Uh, this was actually a show that caused me uh, to want to continue to watch 24 Legacy as well, because primarily the way they showed John Donovan at the end and his desire to continue running for president and the way I interpret it is, uh, interpreted it anyway, as I said before, of him wanting to understand what the heck is going on with this shadow government and these shadow players who are all around me, yet they're either getting away with bloody murder or they're killing themselves in order to get away with bloody murder. What is happening? So that's what galvanized me to want to see another season of 24 Legacy because I want to see what John Donovan's journey is going to be now. And of course... I now also want to see what Eric Carter's journey is going to be as well. So, that's what I have to say about 24 Legacy. I reasonably enjoyed this series. I think that there were a few ups and downs about it. Uh, probably more downs than ups, if I say speak quite honestly. But nonetheless, I reasonably enjoyed this series. And I would probably, I don't know what kind of star rating or t a number of numerical rating I'd give it at this point. I'd probably have to give it only, to be realistic with you, I'd probably only have to give it between 2.5 to 2.75 stars, which is average, very average. 
if I were to give it a numerical rating, I would probably again, again be between four and a half to five and a half stars overall. So that's something for you guys to think about, 24 Legacy, and for you to earn the favor of those of us who are original series fans and who wanted and still might want to give you a chance to earn our props. So that's what I've got to say about 24 Legacies season finale. If it comes back for a second season, we'll see what happens. If not, it has been a nice average run and we'll see what happens with the next show. So until next time, 24 and 24 Legacies fans, live another day.